Do you like the westerns? They've got so many westerns on television, they have to have different guns to tell the plots apart. One night a guy's got a 32, another night a 38, and I saw a fellow with a 39.50 marked down from $40. Hell of a gun. Even the heroes identify themselves with special guns. Saturday night, wanted, bouncing killer. He's got that sharp rifle, and he flips it out of that holster, and he cocks it. <laughs> and he laughs, and he cocks it, and he laughs, and he cocks it, and he laughs. And <laughs> He's a gay cocker. Thursday night, the fellow with the derby, the gold-headed cane, Bat Guano. No, that's not right. Uh. Bat Masterson. He goes around hitting him on the head with a cane. One night, one of those villains is going to take that cane and shove it, and he'll never finish the series. He'll wind up as a ballerina dancer in Dodge City. John Payne and Restless Gun. Richard Boone and Have Gun Will Travel. Peter Gun, Have Boone, Won't Travel. They even have some new ones coming out. I don't know where the hell they're going to put them. They're using Channel 3 for a stable right now. There's one called The Bushwhacker. There's a great show. It's not a Western, The Bushwhacker. That's a barber in a maternity hospital. Sponsored by Cavalcade of Sports. That figures. Whack, how many strokes on this course, Charlie? Never played it, Sam. Oh. The Lone Ranger, 15 years. Everybody likes him. He's been up there wearing that mask. Everybody thinks it's publicity. Publicity, my eyes, such a lousy actor, he's afraid his neighbors will recognize him. Besides that, he's having trouble with that damn Indian friend of his, Tonto. He just found out Kimo Sabi means up to Gigi. <laughs> Fifteen years. You've been getting the commercial, he's been getting the behind the rock. Take the immortal words of that famous Indian Cochise when he landed on his horse bareback. Gee, damn! <laughs> And Geronimo, did you know that Geronimo was considered the fiercest of all the Apache? Well, the real story on the guy is he was queer. The fact he'd stand on the hillside, tell the other Indians, let's attack the wagons, huh? Anything that moved, get it. I like to watch them. I watch Wagon Train. They have guest stars. Yeah, last week they had a striptease dancer on. She was a sheriff. Everybody in town was trying to get into her posse. They were ready to back her up, too. There were a few Greek merchants in the same town. Uh, I saw one western, his cowboys riding on his horse, and a snake come out of the rocks. He reaches for his gun, and the snake says, don't shoot me, heavens, I am a fairy prince. And the cowboy looked down, and he said, boy, you guys are everywhere, aren't you? He said, if you spare my life, I'll give you three wishes. Anything? Anything. All righty, I like to look like Rock Hudson. The girls are crazy about him. I like to be built like Mr. America. And as an added favor, if you don't mind, I like to be equipped like my horse. Is it a deal, huh? <laughs> Next morning, the cowboy gets up, he runs to the mirror, <gasps> looks just like Rock Hudson, whips off his pajama top, muscles bulging like Mr. America, and his eyes are gleaming with excitement, and he looks down. Oh, hell, I was riding old Nell yesterday. <laughs> he don't know how lucky he is. He's riding on Fort Knox. Oh, but they have all kinds of shows, adventure shows. I like all of them. I like that adventure. Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. There he is in Alaska. He's trailing that criminal over the snows with the dogs. What a man. Mush. On Blackie, boy. Go. Ha, ha. On Queenie, girl. On Blackie. We got to get him now. On Blackie. On. No, Blackie. Don't get on Queenie now. No, stop it. Well, there he goes. And Tarzan series. I like Tarzan in the jungle. Standing there in that tree. What a man. Oh. Uh, Oh, 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 damn it, Jane. How many times have I told you? Swing on the vine. But 11 o'clock at night, you get tired of the westerns. That's when you sit in your easy chair and you relax. Pour yourself a nice cold drink. You sit back and you watch. Shock theater. Have you seen it? It's not on television. It's your wife coming in a room in a dirty nightgown, curlers in her hair, a pound of cold cream on her face, and open-toed gym shoes with spurs on. Scared the living hell out of you. 22 pounds of steel right on her head. When she leans down to kiss you, she'll tear your face right in the shreds. I shouldn't say that about my wife. I can say this about my wife with pride. After watching Bridget Bardot and Marilyn Monroe, I'm convinced my wife is a boy. She's fat, man. Is she fat? 412 pounds. Oh, boy, what I have to go through. But she's losing weight. She went to Vic Tanny's, and one day she lost 57 pounds. One of those damn machines tore her right leg off. <laughs> but we've been happy 15 years now, haven't we, George? Uh, you got to remember your honeymoon. That's when it really counts. I remember my honeymoon three days and three nights. I never even saw the falls. 
I figured the fourth day we ought to have some outside entertainment. The bellboy brought the tray up. I asked him what movies were in town. He told me. My wife was in the other room. I says, honey, would you like to see Oliver Twist? She says, you do any more tricks with that damn thing, and I'm going home to mother. <laughs> Young couple next door just come back from the honeymoon. We give them a presents, you know, beautiful Japanese kimono with hand-embroidered bluebirds design and everything. So I saw her the other day. I said, how was the honeymoon? She said, ah! Well, I know it was great. <laughs> Wonderful, but how was it? She said, oh, it was the wildest. Did you like the presents? Oh, my husband was wild about the robe. Oh, he kissed each little bluebird individually. Then he screamed, ooh, I found the nest. And he went crazy. <laughs> oh, but Sunday morning, that's when it really counts. The kids are out the wife's in the kitchen with the breakfast and the coffee. I'm well relaxed, feeling romantic. I don't want to get out of bed, but I want to let her know. So I write a little note, stick it in the collar of the dog. He trots in the kitchen. She gets the note and she reads it. The pole is up, the tent is spread. Forget the breakfast and come back to bed. Turns it over, writes it on the other side and sends it back. But now I can hardly wait. This is it. I get the note that says, take the pole down, put the tent away. The monkey had a hemorrhage. There'll be no circus today. If you don't get that, you oughtn't be allowed out after 8 o'clock. <laughs> this is no howdy doody program, you know. I like the old songs, the best songs, like Don't Worry About the Shrimp Boat's Mother, Father's Coming Home with the Crab. There was a hell of a number. <laughs> I will I ever find a girl with a big behind. Oh, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> eh, well, I shouldn't sing, you know. I have a frog in my throat. First piece of meat I've had all week. That a singing will recite something risque. That's French for dirty, means filthy. There was a young lady from Ransom who was loved three times in a hansom. When she cried out for more, came a weak voice from the floor. My name is Simpson, not Samson. <laughs> I for the children's hour. Oh, Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get up her dog a bone. When she got back, there was a bitch in a shack and Rover had a bone of his own. <laughs> the more modern version, old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get up her dog some bread. Once she stooped over, Rover took over and bred Mother Hubbard instead. Boy, <laughs> That was the beginning of French bread. We used to learn nursery rhymes in school, like ding dong dell, the pussy's in the well. I damn near drowned trying to prove it. <laughs> Kids today talk about satellites, guided missiles, space travel. I got a boy nine wanted a space outfit for his birthday. I bought him one, great big bubble helmet. Fits right over his head. It's wonderful, we don't hear from him anymore. He was in the yard flying from tree to tree, rocket gun, ray pistol, disintegrator tank. The kid next door comes over, same age, got a cowboy suit on. He looks at my boy and he goes, bang, bang, you're dead. My boy turns around with a space gun. He goes, you're sterile. Doesn't sound like much, but every mother is looking for that gun for Christmas. <laughs> we didn't have space guns. We used to play marbles. Remember that? You used to have the little steelies. You'd knuckle down, boing, crack the other guy's shooter, get him out of the game. This youngster had several steelies in his pocket. He stood up in school, not realizing there was a hole in the pocket. They all bounced out. Boing, boing, boing. The teacher jumped up. All right, class, who has the steel balls? The other kid yells, Superman! <laughs> he got A in science. <laughs> I saw two youngsters about nine years of age coming home from school. They stopped behind the garage. Little boy Willie turned to Susie. He says, Susie, you're the first girl I ever loved. She says, damn it, I got another beginner. <laughs> they, don't misunderstand me. I love kids. After all, what is a child? A little bundle of joy brought to your house by a long-legged, skinny personality with a long, narrow beak. But maybe your wife is built differently than mine. <laughs> I come home the other night, she had the suitcase out, putting all the clothes in. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm leaving. I'm tired of you running around drinking every night with strange women. I don't have to put up with it. I'm going to Vegas. I can get $20 what I've been giving you for nothing. I didn't argue. I took out my suitcase. I'm putting my clothes in it. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to Vegas. I want to see how the hell you're going to live on $20 a month. <laughs> of course, if you're single, this means nothing for you. If you're married, you may not even be that lucky. <laughs> I come home the other night. There was a strange man in the bedroom with my wife in a compromising position. I said, see here now. Just what are you two doing? She said, see, didn't I tell you he was stupid? Two ladies at the bar, one nudged the other. She said, I don't want to be catty, honey, but your husband is chasing other women. The first lady said, who the hell cares? We got a dog to chase his cars. When he catches them, he can't drive them. <laughs> I'm telling you, a married man deserves a medal. He works eight hours a day, five, six days a week. Why? Certainly it couldn't be for the money. There's nothing left. He works for her. 
He comes home, the door opens, she says, hello, darling, puts him in an easy chair, pours him a nice cold beer, a scotch over the rock, barbecued steak, chicken just the way he likes it. After the meal, she turns the lights down low, puts on the hi-fi set, slips into the sexy negligee, and she comes over and she grabs him and she hugs him, and squeezes him and kisses him and really gets him, oh, you know what that means to a married man? It means he's in the wrong damn apartment, that's what it means. He's sure in hell ain't home. Well, whether you're married or single, the thing today is to have good health. I went to the doctor the other day. I said, Doc, I got a sore throat. He says, go in the next room and take off your clothes. Well, he was a young doctor. I figured, you know, he'd like to see what's new. I went in, undressed, turned around. There were seven guys lined up against the wall, stark naked. I felt like I was looking right into a delicatessen window. Kielbasa, pepperoni, woo, Braunschweiger. Reminded me of the army, all those guys that remember on the barracks, cold, naked, and shivering, all of them being drafted. There was one little boy from Tennessee. I'll never forget him. He had a small mouth harmonica that big. Homesick, tears rolling down his cheek. He was sitting, singing, and playing. Oh, my darling, we were dancing to the tent. Six hundred guys, naked as jaybirds, tears in their eyes, run right in each other's arms, and they're waltzing cheek to cheek all over the whole barracks. Well, it may seem silly to you, but they were the ones that got out. <laughs> Two doctors in the hallway. One doctor nudged the other. He says, hey, do you cheat on your wife? The other one says, who else? He says, are you getting any on the side? He says, they moved it. <laughs> One old man, about 85, came in for a blood test. The doctor said, what are you wanting for? He says, I'm going to marry a 16-year-old girl. He says, at your age? Well, this could be fatal. The old man says, so she'll die. Another old man comes in, he's over 60. He says, Doctor, I'd like you to lower my sexual potency. The doctor looked at him. Oh, a man your age, over 60? Oh, it's all in your mind. He says, I know that, damn it. I want you to lower it. <laughs> One lady comes in and says, Doctor, my husband has a very strange habit. He gets in bed at night and nibbles on the lobes of my ears. He says, Don't worry, take a little Limburger cheese and rub it on. She says, ah, That's a good idea. Four days later, the same woman, her ears are all bandaged up with band aids. She looks at the doctor, you and your stupid ideas. I put the Limburger cheese on. Now he comes to bed with a bottle of beer and a loaf of pumpernickel. <laughs> Lady sitting in the dentist chair. The dentist walks in. She jumps up. Don't touch me. I'd rather have a baby and have the tooth pulled. He says, make up your mind, lady, so I can adjust the chair and use the proper tool. <laughs> One woman went to his doctor's. My husband doesn't kiss me. He doesn't even shake hands with me. Do you have any kind of drugs at all that could help me? He said, well, we have hormones in a powdered form. Put it on his food. We don't guarantee results, but they've been fairly effective. Oh, well, I'll try anything once. It may take six months to a year. Well, I'm desperate. Three days later, she's hammering on the door, waving a subpoena. Open up, you quack. I'm going to sue. The doctor opened the door. He calms her down. Now, what's your trouble? Trouble? I put that powder on his food like you told me. Halfway through the meal, he jumps up like a maniac. Kicks the chair, grabs the tablecloth, boing, and the dishes are flying, the chicken, the gravy, the coffee, the milk, and the biscuits, and he picks me up, throws me on the table, and ooh, doctor, what a wild half hour that was. He said, well, that's what you wanted. Well, hell yes, but we'll never be allowed back in that restaurant again. <laughs> They're having smorgasbord there all week now. Doctor examined me, I said, well, doc, tell me, how do I stand? He says, I'll be damned if I know. I said, well, I haven't been feeling myself lately. He says, my boy, I'm proud of you. He says, you need a woman in the worst way, and the worst way I could think of was standing up in the canoe. The doctor had a better way, coming down Mount Baldy on a pair of skis. You got to be pretty good to hit a knothole at the right height at 40 miles an hour. I said, I can't ski. He said, why don't you take up golf? I went over to golf professional. I said, I'd like to learn to play golf. He says, fine. Do you have any balls? I said, sure, but on cold mornings, they're kind of hard to locate. He says, come around tomorrow, my boy. We'll tee off in front of the clubhouse. You will. I'll go behind the barn. <laughs> no, we use a tee. I said, what's that? He said, the little thing about the size of a finger. That I've got. I want you to stick it in the ground and put your ball on. The hell you say. You're going to play the game sitting down? He said, no, you stick it in the ground. You put your ball on it. You stand up. Well, that's stretching things too damn far for me. Do you know how to hold the club? Well, I've developed a peculiar grip over the years. <laughs> he says, my boy, you grab it with both hands. Right then and there, I knew he didn't know what in the hell he was talking about. He said, when you get a good grip on it, swing it over your right shoulder. Oh, that's not me, that's the bartender. 
He said, no, let me show you how to hold the club. And he sneaks around behind me and he's reaching and he's, but he didn't get me. Hell, I wasn't in the Navy four years for nothing, you know. They get to the clubhouse, there's a sign on the wall. Don't use the bath towels to wash your balls, use a wire brush. That's all, I quit. He said, we're all ready now. Tea in the ground, ball in the tee, take the club, hit the ball, and it soars and soars. I can damn well imagine it would. He says, right now, you're on the green. I said, what's that? He says, that's where the hole is. You must be colored blind. He says, right here is where you use your putter. It's the smallest club made. Well, you're lucky you're looking at the man who owns it. Now, my boy, is your big moment. You put the ball in the hole. I had my big moment. I've been dipping that putter in the hole. No, when you finish this hole, you make 17 more. You got the wrong guy because after two, I'm shot to hell. He said, you can't make 18 holes in one day. I said, no, it takes me 18 days to make one hole. Besides, how do I know when I'm on the 18th hole? He said, well, that's easy. A red flag pops up. Just my gosh damn luck. And if it's luck at all, there's always three things you learn in show business. You stand up to be seen, you speak loud to be heard, and when you have an audience as nice as this, you sit down to be appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>